five o'clock on my side, so I think we, we're going to begin. Um, good day to all of you for joining us, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for the fourth of the five-part sport webinar series. I'd like to welcome and introduce two young men, who both of whom were Upton's past pupils. If you've been following hockey, you'll know that the Indian national teams are dominant forces in international hockey, and much of their team's success is due to their athletic performance performances on the pitch. The coaches behind those faster field sprints, quick acceleration, rapid change of direction, and amazing stamina are scientific as well as strength and conditioning coaches, Wayne Lombard and Robin Arkell. Uh, Wayne has been applying his passion for over 10 years with athletes around the world with humility, passion, empathy, and patience being the cornerstones of his approach. Wayne has had the privilege to see many of his athletes perform at the highest level. He competed completed his undergrad and honours degrees at the University of Wazulu Natal. He then joined the Sports Science Institute of South Africa as a biokinetist and performance enhancement specialist at the High Performance Centre, I think that's in Cape Town. After this, he went on to complete his master's degree and is kind of currently registered for his PhD in exercise science at the University of Cape Town. Wayne has worked with some of the best athletes in South Africa, China, and is currently based in India. Our second guest alongside is Robin Arkell, who is the National Strength and Condition who's sorry, he's the Na National Strength and Conditioning Associated Association accredited coach, currently based in India as well. He's the head of strength and conditioning for the senior men's Indian hockey team. Robin completed his sports science degree from the University of Stellenbosch and his master's degree in biokinetics from the UC University of Cape Town, specializing in rugby union youth development. Robin has previously worked as the head of strength and conditioning with University of Cape Town's uh, varsity cup team in their winning year, well, winning the cup in 2014, as well as being the head of strength and conditioning for the Pumas senior curry cup team. Robin currently finds his passion in all things high performance development with specific focus on special strength and power development in team sport athletes. Our guests will be doing a presentation this afternoon, and if you have any questions, Please could you kindly share them on the side chat bar. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Wayne and Robin and enjoy. Oh, thanks, Brendan. Uh, Rob, do you want to say anything before I share my screen? No, I think just um, thanks so much, Brendan. And uh, it's obviously an honor for us to be able to uh, give back to the Uplands community. Um, Uplands gave us so much throughout our schooling career and it's obviously um, set us up, you know, uh, really well for our careers so far. So um, we're really appreciative and honoured to be able to chat to you guys this evening. Yeah, awesome. Uh, can you see my screen yet or is it off? Must I share it again? I think Jen will allow for the screen to be shared. Okay, let's see. Um, it should connect soon, it says. Just let me know, give me a thumbs up if you can see it, then I'll get going. It's loading, yes. There we go. Cool. Awesome. Okay, oh, yeah, thanks, Brandon. Thanks for the introduction. Really appreciate that you have Rob's and I on. Um, like you mentioned, most of today we're going to be going through a, a presentation with everyone. Um, the idea behind it is to give some of the data related to strength conditioning for youth, also some of the latest data on how to return to play post a long layoff like we've all experienced now um, over the last two months or so. Um, on that, we're going to speak a little bit of um, early versus late specialization, the pros and cons of it. Um, and yeah, so there's quite a bit of information to get through. So if anyone has questions throughout, please drop it in the chat box and then Robs will stop me and then we can either answer it while we're going through or um, we can answer them all at the end how we go. Okay, but I think I'll get stuck into it quite a bit of information to get through and um, yeah, I don't want to keep you guys too long either. So yeah, the main crux of our philosophy is trying to build a robust youth athlete in any environment. And what we mean by that robust athlete is our whole job is to try and ensure that the coaches can keep their best players on the pitch for as long as possible. Um, not only is it from a performance perspective, but it's also from an injury prevention perspective. When it comes to youth athletes, the same concepts are applied. However, we also have to introduce fun into it. And we also have to understand that youth athletes are not just little adults, they are growing. And we need to understand that 
things have to be done a little bit differently to ensure they le uh, reach peak performance. So um, just on that, so if we look at what is a robust athlete, it's a healthy, powerful, and vigorous athlete that is resilient to the demands placed on him. And that last sentence is probably the most important thing for me, is that they need to be resilient to whatever the coaches are able to throw at them. So from an international athlete perspective, what Robs and I do is try and ensure that if the the athletes, they are prepared for that, regardless of what the coaches are able to or wanting to throw it in. The athletes are physically prepared for it and they are resilient enough to um, not get injured with what the coaches are throwing at them. Um, and a lot of that comes down to how we plan and how we actually do um, our planning throughout the year. But before we get onto all that, it's also important, I think, in a, from a youth athlete perspective, that we change our concept and our whole paradigm. and. We come up with this where we start with the end in mind where we know that there is some sort of paradigm shift that is required in our programming because currently what most of us are doing is training and um, that we're designing our training programs to um, create short-term competitive advantage for our athletes without considering what are the positive or negative um, aspects to our programming for future athletic development and that's more important at a youth level is that we consider okay whatever we're doing now is is it or is it negatively going to affect our athletes and that's one of the big questions we need to ask and if the answer is whatever the we what you decide is positively affecting the future performance of that athlete we're probably going to put them at a better stead than what we are if we're only focusing on winning right now so what is the mission? We've got two approaches that we can do. I call it an inefficient or efficient approach. And the inefficient approach is focusing on the now, although that can facilitate performance in the early years, it probably is detrimental to the optimal future development of the athlete. And what we want to know is ensure that we can actually make sure that the athlete is going to be able to perform later on in their career, not only now, but also by focusing on long-term athlete development, if we can call it that, um, we, we try to avoid burnout, overuse injuries and those sort of things. And we'll speak a little bit more about the loads and those sort of things as we go through the presentation. Whereas a more efficient approach would be the aim of athletic training should be enable the individual athletes to tolerate training loads and thus maximize his or her technical and tactical coaching. So if we go back to what we said before about building a robust athlete, our whole focus is trying to make sure that they are primed and ready for their technical and tactical coaching. So in other words, they are ready for their sport. So the transfer on what we're doing off the pitch to on the pitch is extremely important. And that's, that's the same for youth athletes as well. So what is the process that we need to follow? And what we have to understand is the, that it's not a one day thing. It's going to be a three, four, five, six year process that we need to go into it. And we'll show you a paper we published late, um, a little bit later where we speak about a five tier system where every athlete, what, what, you know, what schools have um, an advantage is that each athlete they have is in their system for five years pretty much. So you can plan where you want those athletes to get to pretty well. So this is just a quote from a paper. And basically it says it's evident that many or, or most, youth, most, most youth athletes lack basic physical athleticism thus starting at a very low base of physical fitness and possibly technical skill. Even though some degree of general sports skill may be fairly well developed, the same is often not true for fundamental movement patterns. Therefore, the need for effective program to readdress these issues is paramount and possibly requires a new model of development to be devised which builds elements of long-term model rather than a short-term fix. And Rob's and I see this at um, elite level a lot as well, especially with athletes who are specialized early, that their basic fundamental movement patterns and their basic ability to do um, other things besides their sport is pretty poor. So we got to re regress when our athletes come through to elite level even and retrain those basic kind of movement patterns. Whereas if we can address that at an early age, you'll see later it's a lot more beneficial for our youth athletes. So if we move on and keep that paradigm shift in, in our mind, what we have to also realize that we, we already know that to become an expert in anything, we need a lot of training. So we need to be exposed to that um, sport or that skill a lot to become an expert. We know that. However, how we get to that is, a, is really important and that process needs to be understood. And I already said that benefits of a high school is athletes are in your system for five years. And then 
each tier that we'll show you just now will have a different focus. And we need to understand those focuses, one leads into the other. And we, if we skip that process, it becomes very detrimental for our athletes. Thus, optimizing each system within that, um, those different tiers will help the athletes perform later on. So how do we go about this? So every school, like we said, has uh, the athletes that need to understand what type of athlete they want to develop in five years, four years, whatever it might be, whenever they come into your system. But if most of us come in in grade eight and go through to matric, we'll have them for those five years. So it's important that we understand what type of athlete you want to develop and for which sport we want to develop those athletes for. And one of our big philosophies with how we work is that it's athlete first, sport second. If we can develop really good athletes, it'll benefit their sport. However, if we're focusing on just improving their sport, it's very difficult sometimes to produce athletes that are actually resilient to the demands placed on them. So students should not solely be judged on the number of wins at school, but more, more by the number of wins outside of school. And what we mean by that is that sometimes we're so focused on winning a under 14A, under 14B game, but is that actually going to make a difference for the future of that athlete? I would often argue probably not. And if we can start regressing on that win ratio at a young age, we're probably going to benefit our athletes a lot more as they go through their careers, especially when they get to the more competitive phase, which you'll see in the tier system just now, um, in that when they start playing first team sports and intro sport later on. So this was a paper published, uh, I think it was two years ago now, and it's basically about how to build a robust athlete in the African high school system. And this is the tier system we've been speaking about. So we know that all our athletes go through from grade 8 to grade 12, and we need to understand that what we implement at each phase is going to be important for the development of that athlete in the next phase. So if we understand that in our grade eights, they're coming in, and sometimes they come in a very, very low athletic level. And if we can readdress all these aspects, so the movement efficiency, the ABCs, stability, mobility, and getting them fitter, so this developmental phase prior to going into this transition phase, every stage will help that athlete get better and better. And that's where your strength and conditioning comes in, and we'll go a bit more in depth about that a little bit later. But the important part is to understand and identify in your school system what is it that your athletes are lacking and how you're going to go about actually identifying and to improve those, those aspects. So is it these movement efficiencies that they are lacking? How do we improve that? And you guys are lucky you got your own on, on um, campus SNC and they'll be able to help you with that. But the important part is allowing that process to take place. Once you've identified the developmental aspect going into the transitioning, transition phase, and then identifying and or understanding that now structured SNC becomes really important because they're going to be from this phase, they're going to be going into competitive sport with um, first team play, sometimes playing under 18 Craven weeks or whatever provincial weeks that they're going to be playing in. And then it becomes a little bit more um, professional, becomes a little bit more competitive, and the pressure is a lot higher. So their bodies need to be really, really primed and ready for that aspect. But if we're skipping these two phases yeah, prior to this competitive phase, we're putting our athletes at risk of overuse injuries, burnout, and actually not actually performing to their actual capabilities. So that's just what the five-tier system would be. And these are the aspects, and all these take, so where you see fatigue resistance, biometric strength, coordination, and dynamic stability, these will take place in every single phase, but the type of exercise in each phase will change, and the complexity of the exercise, the volume, and the intensity will change as well per, um, per phase. And that's where the important part, that the collaboration between the sports department, the strength and conditioning department, as well as the academic department become quite, becomes quite important. So how do we gain that competitive edge? One thing we have to understand about sport now is that it's basically about Darwin in, in nature and that generally the fastest, strongest and the best athletes make it to the top level. So it's really important that we understand that strength and conditioning is important for young athletes. And we'll give you more information on that as we go through the presentation. But how we implement it and the process that we go about implementing that strength and conditioning is really important. So I just want to show you some evidence on that athletes are becoming bigger, faster, and stronger, so we can build, get ready, drive home that importance of the strength and conditioning part of it. But we also have to understand there's this continuous battle between fitness and fatigue. And as we're doing more and more exercise, the body, yes, will adapt to it eventually. But what we have to understand is as fitness increases, fatigue increases linearly with that. So without structured programming and, stru and 
identified periods of rest, the yeah. athletes will never actually adapt to the program well mm -hmm. enough and they'll just accumulate fatigue over time. And that's when you lead to burnout, injuries, and so on and so forth. One thing we also know about fitness and fatigue is that the relationship, as you start resting, fitness will still keep increasing, but fatigue will decrease. So fatigue, the decay of fatigue is a lot faster than what fitness is. So you need periods of rest to allow the athletes to adapt in the program. Then this, this was a really good paper published by Ross Tucker and Malcolm Collins from UCT. And they basically showed that every athlete has a predefined genetic potential. However, if we're implementing the correct program for that athlete, we'll be able to supersede that genetic potential if we do it in a structured process and a structured way that is beneficial to our youth athletes. And again, I'll show you a little bit later on how we can do that. And here's a little bit more evidence on how sport is becoming bigger, faster, and stronger. And this study, they looked at, you can predict the World Cup winners just purely on the height and the weight of the of the team as well as the collective experience of the team and then this paper also just went and showed the various aspects of the morphological changes of athletes over the 20th century and then i published this paper in my for my masters where we showed that um over a 13 year period for under so the cycling under 20 rugby teams that there was a huge increase in not only mass but there was about a 30 to 40 percent increase in upper body strength and lower body strength as well so we can see that vast change in athletic the importance of making sure athletes are robust and resilient enough to the demands that they're going to be facing. So if we want to understand a little bit more about the strength and conditioning, and I know there's a lot of skepticism behind strength and conditioning for youth athletes, and large amounts of it comes from poor articles that are written like this. So this was actually a statement from a pediatrician. And she said, children should not do strength training exercise that builds muscles such as using weights because it puts pressure on their developing bones, which makes them vulnerable. Other than that, the child should be able to do, you know, get involved in any exercise. The problem with that statement, and it's really strange that a doctor would say that, is that they take out physiology completely. So what we need to understand about young people's bodies, they are like sponges and they absorb the um, anything you throw at them quite easily and the funny thing about that statement is what you also forget is that actual axial loading so loading on the skeletal system of the young athlete is actually cause a resorption process which means that the bones actually start getting stronger so any sort of um, load can help those bones actually get stronger and, and for resorption to take place, then it needs load, it needs some sort of axial loading to get those bones stronger. And that's also been shown in evidence with patients with arthritis and those sort of things. Um, so it's a bit of a strange statement and those statements are very damaging to the industry. So then there's a whole lot of position statements that have come out in support of strength and conditioning. And this one over here was one of the most important ones because it was eventually endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics as well, which means that they have realized that, okay, there is maybe a mistake in um, some of the misconceptions of strength and conditioning uh, for youth athletes. And it's actually beneficial and it'll probably be better off for them as they go through their careers. So this paper is an interesting one as well. And something called the Hypothesis. Uh, just go a little bit out, sorry, a little bit too far. And basically, in 1983, they said that if you implement um, strength conditioning or any sort of physical conditioning to youth athletes, that they're not going to adapt because there's no control of their hormonal system. The problem, again, with that is it's a very big generalization of um, physiology. And they're not identical or understanding that everyone is a little bit different. And a lot of the changes that happen in youth athletes are actually from the neuromuscular adaptations rather than muscle mass adaptations. However, even in that argument, there is a very wide variety of the different adaptations that occur. And that's just an example of young athletes who are, or young kids who are able to put on a lot of muscle mass at a very young age. So there again, it throws out that hormonal um, argument from this trigger point of or trigger hypothesis. So what we want to know is what age should we start addressing strength and conditioning? And when we talk about strength and conditioning, we're not speaking about loading huge amounts of weights on their backs and doing squats and cleans and snatches and so on and so forth. Teaching movement patterns, 
climbing ropes, jungle gym, all that type of movement is a type of strength and conditioning. Any external resistance and strength conditioning, band work, body weight work, all that is strength and conditioning to, um, in, uh, to a degree. And what we've seen in this paper here is that the earlier we implement strength and conditioning or basic kind of movement patterns so the developmental phase of our athletes. So if we implement it earlier, so this line up top here, so they implemented it pre-adolescent, their ability to express their, or be greater than genetic, genetic potential is a lot higher than someone who implements it later, for so example, at adolescent. Someone who only does sport won't develop as well as someone who implements various strength conditioning aspects plus their sport. And if someone does no sport or integrated neuromuscular type training, they will not get to that genetic potential. So again, the argument for the early inclusion of things such as integrated neuromuscular training, so ABCs, agility, balance, coordination, uh, body weight work, and so on and so forth, will help the athlete develop a lot better and get above that genetic potential compared to if you don't actually implement it from an early age. So just to um, give you some of the research behind the injury rates in sports. So what we also know is that in various different sports, are, the, the exposure to injuries a lot higher. So this one's an example from rugby, where you get three to, three to 11 injuries per thousand hours um, and 52 to 105 injuries per thousand hours in matches. So matches, exposure to matches is a lot higher risk to injury um, when compared to training. So this was a South African study by Jason T and his group of um, individuals. I think it was done in, for, in the Johannesburg schools. But again, just showing you that um, injuries occur in sports a lot more than what we would expect them to. In the USA, about 5 million injuries in, in, in athletes under the age of 18 occur every year. And 50% of those are said to be overuse injuries. So those in my, and Rob will probably agree, is that, yeah, is that a lot of overuse injuries are actually preventable with planned periodization, rest periods, and so on and so forth. Then in South African soccer, looking at 227 high school players, 63% of them sustained injuries. And that's a really high percentage. And what I'll show you just now is that with adequate strength and conditioning, we can actually prevent these injuries from happening or get, reduce the risk of these injuries happening. So what we also what what one the, what I want to get across a little bit as well is the understanding that every sport um, that an athlete plays is exposed to very high forces, and that's what one of the big things about strength and conditioning is is trying to make sure that the athletes are can sustain or handle those forces that they're exposed to. So you can imagine a cricketer or fast bowler running in at a young age with the underdeveloped musculoskeletal system and bowling hundreds and hundreds of balls every month or every year. Um, they're exposed to very high forces in their lumbar spine. And one of the most common injuries in young fast bowlers is stress fractures to the lumbar spine. Um, and the same for rugby players. Every tackle, they're exposed to high forces. And if, they are, if, you, if we are worried about the forces that are exposed to during strength and conditioning, it's probably a misnomer because... They, they're exposed to higher forces in their actual sport. And all we're trying to do is prepare them for those forces when we are um, doing strength and conditioning. So how do we reduce that risk of injury? So these are the basic principles of strength and conditioning. We need to know what the intensity, the progression, the specificity, and the overload. And these are aspects that will be taken care of by your resident s &T. And that becomes really important. I've already spoken about the genetic potential and this so we want to supersede that genetic potential. And how do we actually go about doing that? And one of the aspects that we need to understand is that injuries are multifactorial. And no injury it can be said or defined precisely to one aspect. Unless it's an acute fracture of some sort, then, of course, you can say, okay, he got tackled and he fractured his um, a fractured a bone or something like that. So yes, just some of the papers that looked at the different approaches and different aspects of injury reduction rates in, with the use of strength and conditioning. So in this paper here, they looked at, they used pre-season conditioning strategy to develop flexibility, strength, power, and landing mechanics. Using a sample of female soccer, volleyball, and basketball players, they found that six weeks of preventative um, intervention decreased the number of serious knee injuries over the next sporting season. So not only are we re reducing the rates of injuries in that current season, but we also it's got a longitudinal effect for our athletes as well by introducing some sort of injury prevention reduction program. 
Then again, they looked over here, pre-season conditioning and prevention strategy and continue throughout the season. So one, they look at what happens if we do stuff before the season. Then they look at what happens if we actually continue that throughout the training phase or out the season throughout the year. And what they found is that if we continue throughout the year, we can actually reduce or have some significant effect of reduction of injuries by 50 to 70 percent of um, injuries in general and a significant reduction in ligamentous injuries like ACL injuries in soccer players. So again, the longer and the more um, exposures our athletes have to the injury prevention or strength and conditioning program, generally the better off they will be. And again, this can be implemented through a uh, structured warm-up and so on and so forth. So one of the conclusions I looked at is the development on application of injury prevention strategies that focus on pre-season conditioning, functional training, education, proprioception, balance training, sports-specific skills, um, which should be continued throughout the sporting season are effective. So again, only doing it once off for two or three months doesn't actually help us as much as it could if we actually continue that. And there's various ways of doing that if we implement it into our warm-up strategies and so on and so forth. And this is a nice paper where they show, oh, sorry, let me just go back a second. Uh, sorry, there we go. So where they showed that by implementing some sort of injury um, prevention strategy, we can actually decrease our overuse injuries by almost a third, or sorry, the overuse injuries by half and other injuries by almost a third. So imagine if we can go about explaining to people that if we implement strength and conditioning strategies and we can reduce the risk of injury by 50 to 75%, um, it's, it's a huge impact on our sporting, our athletes' careers. There are a couple of other aspects that we also need to consider with youth athletes or even anyone at varsity level is one of the big things is a chronic reduction in sleep can also increase the risk of soft tissue injuries. And I think what happens, especially in youth athletes, and I remember from school days, is that there are serious periods of exams where pressure is a hell of a lot and you've got a lot of homework plus exams plus school um, sporting activity. In that period, what, what we have to understand, the body doesn't differentiate between stress. The stress is applied to the body, regardless of its emotional, psychological, if it's um, uh, physical. The body will just try and adapt to that stress. And if it's a negative stress, it, it can, creates a problem for those athletes and their body doesn't actually adapt as well and they actually start becoming fatigued. So identifying or explaining to athletes that, that sleep cycle is really important for reduction in injuries is important. And also the collaboration, again, between the sports department and the academic department become important so something you could look at is looking at aspects where okay we reduce the amount of homework during really big derbies because it's a lot of pressure for the kids and they're busy busy most of the weekend perhaps in that period that's so you can identify as a red flag or a high risk period and you can say to the have some sort of agreement with the academic department so let's reduce the um, stress on the players or the athletes at this period reduce the amount of homework they got so they can focus on the sport for that weekend and then get back into the academic calendar from the monday or whatever it might be um, and again, yeah, uh, over scheduling, and we'll talk a little bit more about training loads and that sort of thing. So, athletes doing too much, too soon, and too often becomes a major risk factor for injuries in youth athletes. And again, we spoke about the academic stress on athletes, and it's been shown that, especially this study was done in NCAA, which is in the USA, and they looked at and they showed that during exam periods, athletes are exposed to higher risk of injury due to um, academic stress, as well as the physical stress of the sport that they are playing. So how do we manage these training loads? And we know in the school system that we've got some athletes that play one sport, some play multiple sports at the same period of time. So I've just we've just done a basic calendar on more or less possibly what a um, school calendar would look like. And yeah, we can see where these overlaps occur between the different sports. And I've had quite, quite a few presentations to different schools when we were still in South Africa, and there's always this pool of these athletes between rugby, cricket, hockey, whatever it might be, because every coach wants their bit of that athlete. But the important thing we already mentioned in the beginning is that every decision we make needs to be centered around the athlete. What is the best thing for that athlete to, what's the best decision for that athlete to make him a better athlete at both sports and not specifically at one sport? And that's where the collaboration between coaches and the um, sports department becomes really important in how to manage 
these periods, yeah, where we see these big overlaps in different uh, um, sports. So this is just a schematic on what generally happens in most cases. So we know that when we're training, we apply some sort of training stimulus, maybe some sort of poor performance occurs, and we get to the, the once that a poor performance occurs, there's some sort of knee-jerk reaction that happens in a lot of coaching um, staff. And what they think is, okay, we've poor, performed poorly, so now we need to train a little bit more because more training is going to make us better. However, when we start adding more and more load to athletes, we start getting to this period where they express a lot of symptoms of fatigue without us knowing it. And then they get into this zone of diminishing returns, which means the more we do, the less they're going to adapt. So we can do however much we want. It's actually going to be a negative effect on those athletes. And that knee-jerk reaction of doing more and thinking more is going to be the solve to our problems of our poor performance puts our athletes at risk. And if we don't adapt or intervene at this point, yeah, where we see these symptoms of fatigue actually increasing, we get very close to non-functional overreaching, overtraining, overuse, and burnout, where athletes actually start um, not enjoying the sport anymore and are higher risk of injury. And we really want to avoid this because for athletes to come out of this zone, especially youth, youth athletes, is really, really difficult and takes months and months of um, deloading to get them out of that um, uh, overuse or overtraining um, stages. So this is a really good study on just an idea of how injury rates increase during high load periods, especially as the season progresses. So this was done by Tim Gabbard, who's a really good researcher from Australia. And what he showed was that at different stages of the season, if we do not manage our loads and we get to a period where these likelihood of injuries will increase. So the basic take home message would be when we got high volume of matches, so in season periods, and we don't reduce that load on the athlete, they're susceptible to injury. And this is again, just showing that exact graph on how to manage the load as the season goes into the competitive phase. So yes, preseason in the blue block, you got early competition phase in the red block and late competition phase in the green block. If we maintain that load throughout, our likelihood and probability of injury for any athlete, not only youth athletes, is really high. So managing that load here is extremely important. So now imagine we got someone who's playing rugby in the rugby season. We're getting that transition into the cricket season. We're starting your preseason for cricket, but we still got a high volume of um, rugby matches in this period. We're increasing our cricket load, but we don't manage it as well as we could for the multi-sport athlete. Then we're exposing that player that's involved in both sports to a higher risk of injury and higher higher um, overload or um, non-functional overreaching. And the same for hockey into any sport that that, you, that that athlete might be or the athletes might be doing. So these periods, again, can be flagged as high-risk periods. So the late pre-season pre or late competition phase of the one sport moving to pre-season of another sport are those areas of where um, are high risk for our players. These are just averages and how we work this out is a very simple thing is that you ask your player to rate your their session from 1 to 10 or 0 to 10, 0 being no, no intensity, no session, 1 being very, very low intensity, 10 being absolutely maximal intensity. Multiply that by the duration of your training session and that will give you this training load over here. And these are basic guidelines that you can use, but I'll give you more specific guidelines a little bit later for youth athletes as well. And that's a very simple thing coaches can implement where they can ask a couple of athletes, what is your rate of perceived exertion, your RPE for this session, and just record it, get the session, and they just track it over time to get an idea of more or less what the training load is for that specific session. And if we start exceeding these values, then we start seeing that there is a higher risk of injury for our athletes. So what we do know is, if we actually explained earlier, is that fatigue accumulates in proportion to strength and duration of that stimulus. If we don't rest, we get to this um, part of non-functional overreaching or maladaptation. But if the stimulus is not applied with sufficient frequency, then we also get detraining, like we've experienced now in this um, lockdown period. So it's that continuous balance between doing enough and not enough, especially in youth athletes who are also under academic pressure. And then we get to this point, yeah. So what we do know is if we do have a deload period, which is over here, fatigue will dissipate a lot faster than what fitness is. So fitness will still increase. However, if we do not implement some sort of um, 
training stimulus at some point, fatigue will still dissipate, but so will fitness at some point in that um, period. So this is just a basic recommendation of someone who's doing one sport and how you can set up a training week. And what we looked at is everything works around a six day turnaround. So we've got match day over here. And that could be, for example, for if it's rugby, maybe on a Saturday morning. If it's hockey, maybe a Wednesday afternoon. I'm not too sure this cat we used to play our hockey matches on Wednesdays or Friday afternoons and then Saturday mornings for rugby. Or whatever it may be, if you work around a match day and you work on the six day turnaround, you'll be able to make sure your athletes are recovered fully before the next match. So match day, we always have maximal loading intensity. So for example, 60 minutes times 10 gives you a load of 600. Then match day plus one, complete rest, or if you go to bike and assist or a physio on board, um, they can implement some sort of recovery strategies that the kids can do at home. Match day plus two, they can report any injuries, maybe do some light um, skill work or some prehab. Then match day plus three would be practice and strength and auditioning session. And then match day plus four, practice and SNC session, 70-30 split. And then match day plus five is practice only, a very light session. Um, and the same for match day plus six, generally either rest or captain's run, very low volume, very low intensity. And then eventually you get to these type of loads that you can implement with your youth athletes. And then we've, what happens if we've got someone who's playing two sports? And this is where the coaches need to collaborate really well and understand there is some sort of crossover for each sport. And it's really important that the, if they don't collaborate, it becomes really difficult for um, the athlete because generally they get caught in the middle and they want to do the training of both sports as much as they can. However, generally it's probably not advisable that they go and do three or four training sessions plus two matches in a week or whatever it might be. So this is an example of how you can work around um, designing a training week for someone who is in playing two sports. So again, we're working on the six day turnaround match for sport one, maximum load and intensity, match day plus one after sport one would be a rest period, match day plus two, strength conditioning and prehab session, match day plus three, practice for sport two, match day plus two, is, um, sorry, match for sport uh, two is match, yes, max intensity again, and then practice for sport one, captain run and so on and so forth. This is just ideas that you can use to implement it and how you manipulate that within your, um, a training cycle within your school system is completely up to you. And these are just guidelines. The most important thing is to manage these volumes to ensure the athletes are not overexposed to training. This is quite a nice one to use. And it's a rule of thumb is that you should not exceed the number of hours in a week of training compared to the person's age. So for example, someone who is seven to 11 years old, it's important that you are not exceeding a duration of 500 minutes or eight and a half, 8.3 hours and 12 to 13 and so on and so forth. Um, and that's a really easy way to work around your training volumes for your athletes and planning your training sessions around those sort of um, time frames. And then this is an example of how to manage the load. So the session RPE and the training duration for the different aspects of each sport. So for example, under 14s, gym load around about 188 field load of 1,640 and a match load of 690. And that will still give you within that range that does not expose our athletes to overtraining and those sort of things. So I hope that gives a good idea about the training load and all that. And I've gone quite fast because a lot of information to get through, but at the end we'll have a little bit more questions. But this is quite important part of the presentation of is the early versus late specialization because one of the aspects we are asked to talk about and understanding the difference between the two and the pros and cons of the two. So we've all heard about the 10,000 hour rule, but the problem with the 10,000 hour rule is that it's not 100% true because there was research done by Anderson Erickson and what he showed was <clears throat> if professional violence, when he did a, a retrospective study and a recall of the amount of training they did, they came up with a nice number of around about 10,000. But if you look at the graph, it's more around about 10 and a half to 11,000. So the problem with this interpretation of his research is a lot of people did not understand that there were outliers to this rule and that that one 10,000 hours that everyone was talking about was not actually stated in his study. And 
this was shown again over here with different um, aspects of how many years it takes someone to become professional. And what he said is it's the most provocative generalization in research. And everyone's taken this 10,000 hour rule as this golden rule of number of uh, time that is required to become professional sportsmen. But again, if we go back to the beginning of the presentation, we said we know that everyone needs to accumulate a lot of training to become expert in their specific sport or skill. However, the process that we do to get to that expertise is really important. So if we go in and we just give a couple of examples of early versus late specialization, it might become a little bit more clear on why we say maybe early specialization is not the best aspect for everyone. So I think everyone might know this guy. So this is Tiger Woods. And what we know about Tiger Woods is that he started sport at two years old. He has ended up winning multiple official PGA tours and 15 majors. So here's a really good example of early specialization and how it actually worked in his favor. Then this is Stefan Holmes. Stefan Holmes is a high jumper. He won the gold medal in 2004 Olympics. He is said to have accumulated over 20,000 hours of training before he won his gold medal. And he started at the age of eight. So another example where early specialization might work. The problem is, is that there are too many examples outside of that, these outliers that actually are shown in sport nowadays. So we all know this guy. This is Herschel Gibbs, obviously. He played multiple sports at school. He played SA school for rugby, cricket, and soccer. And obviously, we know he had a really successful international cricket career. John T. Rhodes was the same. He, played, he was actually selected for the South African hockey team as well as South African cricket. Played multiple sports at school. And he also had a really successful um, cricketing career. And this is um, a bo bo Bohemian um, high jumper. And he actually went to, so his name is Do uh, Donald, Tom Don Donald Thomas. And he went to NCAA Division University for basketball. Sorry, the spelling of university is terrible. Um, for basketball. And he was one day at the track and track athletes were ragging him a little bit and saying, oh, we can jump high higher than you. So he took up high jump as a dare. And on his first jump, apparently he jumped 198. And if anyone knows high jump, that's not, that's not, that's not the, too easy to do. Second jump, he jumped 215 and then eventually 220. The year after that, in 2007, without even training for a year, he was world champion with a jump of 235. So he's a prime example of where early specialization is not a case for a specific sport. He had the genetic potential to be able to do multiple sports. He took a sport up. He still competes in high jump. However, he has not been as successful as he was in 2007. So these are just different examples of early versus late specialization. And there are some conceptual problems with early specialization. One being that we know it drives early specialization and training at a very young age for a very long time, drives very high training loads. And we spoke about the problems with high training loads in youth athletes. And then early competitive pressure for youth athletes. And we spoke about the difference in pressure and increase in injury rates. And there are very few programs that have access to athletes for this duration of time. And that becomes really important because how do we get access to them to perform enough training to gain 10,000 hours or whatever it might be? So therefore, that integration of multiple sports does, is very beneficial for youth athletes. So various other studies are shown in sports like um, hockey, 5,000 hours. Um, to become elite, wrestlers, 6,000 hours, soccer, 4,000 hours, with 28% of elite athletes partaking in, in their sports for four years or less, generally playing multiple sports before specializing. So I'm not saying that you have to go do a whole lot of sports to become an expert at one. What we are saying is that exposure to different sports is really beneficial to athletes as, an, as a holistic approach. So from a South African example, this is a really good study that was done by Justin Durant from... Um, Sports Science Institute High Performance Center, while we were our manager. And he looked at in 2005, there were 349 under 13 rugby players who took part in under 13 a week. And what they, we want, what they wanted to see from this is what is the conversion rate from under 13 to under 18? And I don't know if, you, if everyone can maybe just have a guess in the comment box here. What do you guys think this conversion rate, how, what percentage of these players played in the under 18 week? And we'll see if anyone gets a decent answer. I'll give it a, a second or two to see if there are any answers that come through. While I have a drink of water. No one willing to take a guess? Yeah, we've got uh, nine 
And uh, there's another one, but I can't see ah, it. Yeah. Oh, there you go. 20%. <laughs> okay, good. Some good guesses. 0.02% close. Yeah. Okay, Eight, nice. 14, good. Okay. So you guys aren't far off. And what we saw was that only 22% of these players reached under 18 level rugby. So the lower, the, this low numbers, which is 77 out of 349. Um, and what we've realized now is that the earlier we start trying to identify elite athletes, the more hit and miss we're going to get. And it's really important that we understand that from an early specialization perspective, if we're trying to select under 13, under 14, under 15, we're probably not going to select the cream of the crop because of another um, phenomenon called the relative age effect, which we'll show you shortly. So the relative age effect is basically a phenomenon, if we can call it that, that splits your birth month into different quartiles within the year. So this young guy would be born in the early, um, early in the year, and these guys would be late in the year, so December and January. And what we know is that if someone is born in this period of time, they almost got one year of development prior, prior to or before these people are even born. And they end up going to school together. And we see this in rugby all the time. So this is Weinberg versus Paul, I think, Rob, so I can't remember. Um, and this is under 14 rugby. So yeah, we can see a cl classic example of relative age effect. And I'm almost bet my bottom dollar that this guy would be born late in the year and this guy was born early in the year. And this is that mismatch when we're talking about special, early specialization and trying to identify elite or identify athletes at a very young age because this guy's still got a lot of growing and um development to do compared to this guy and if we start saying okay he's the better rugby player but what we know from the research is that most of the time that these guys from 16 to 17 physiology starts catching up and actually nullifies the relative age effect and that's why it's really important if we start selecting too young we actually have a lot of mishits and this was proven in the study by um, this group of researchers in Johannesburg, they looked at exactly that and the difference in the percentage of athletes selected in the first half of the year compared to the second half of the year over here um, for different age groups. And you can see as we get older and older, we're seeing that more in that first half are still coming through. Um, but what we do also know is from 16 years on or 17 years onwards, physiology does change and we know that the athletes start catching up um, to each other after that age. So thus, the younger we select our elite level athletes, the more inefficient our talent identification process will be. So the idea would be to wait as long as we can before we're trying to establish um, or um, select our elite level young athletes. And this one was actually published just the other day, and they showed the same sort of thing with early versus late specialization and the negative effects of early specialization um, for our athletes, as well as high training volumes and increased risk of injury if we specialize early and we have very high training volumes in our athletes. So now we get to a little bit of how do we manage our athletes coming back after a long layoff and Rob's and I have had this discussion with quite a few people and I, I, my argument is just be logical and the progressions need to be um, scientifically sound and what we want to under identify is that we need to understand that all these principles of strength and conditioning training or whatever it might be that you want to implement your athletes are actually adhered to so if we go in from day one and we have very high intensity very high volumes we're exposing our athletes to something that they're not actually used to um, because they've been off for a long time and what we also need to understand we're probably going to have two ends of the spectrum we're going to have some athletes who have had done a lot of training in this lockdown period and some players or athletes who have done absolutely nothing. So how do we manage those two opposite ends of the spectrum to understand how do we get about um, programming our training programs? One thing we need to understand also is knowing that a good chronic workload, so the much athletes who have expo been exposed to a high training volume for a prolonged period of time are a little bit more resilient to training volumes than what if you're not if you're not exposed to those training volumes. So and identifying it and what we say is that if someone's had a long time off, we'll always go on that they've actually been completely rested and then we'll progress from almost like a training age of zero. 
So training age of zero would mean that they're coming in from an off season and we need to work on everything to progress them throughout that phase. And knowing that if they've done too much training, there's this ceiling of safety, if we can call it that. Um, if we exceed that, then it's going to be a problem. If they've done nothing and we progress too fast, then there's also going to be a problem in our training. And this just shows that chronic versus acute, uh, chronic workload. If someone's done a lot of strength training and that over a period of time, they'll be more resilient to um, injuries. And if they've been exposed to good fitness training programs in this period of time, they'll also be more resistant to injuries. So these green blocks, yeah, they fit us, so they're less susceptible to injury. And same there for relative strength and relative um, uh, injury rates. This was published by Australian Institute of Sport, and this is a really good way to look at it. And what they showed is if you've done more 20, 40, 60, or 80 percent of your full training, and the amount of time you have off, how much time it will get back. So if we take, for example, an athlete who's done no training over the last two months, so we say eight weeks, um, they will require 16 weeks to get back to full training. So it will take uh, the progression is a long time um, to get back to that full potential. If we take 40%, it might take you 13 and a half weeks for, um, or 13.8 weeks and so on and so forth. The bottom line with this is to understand that if they've done nothing, we've got to progress pretty slowly to get them back to that um, the pre-lockdown pre state. But if they've done 80%, it might go a little bit quicker. But also remember, we've got two ends of the spectrum. Some have done lots, some have done not, not so much. And how we start with that is important. So basically, what we would like to say is that you start very general with a very broad um, goal in mind and trying to get the basic development of the athlete's aerobic system, level of strength, and so on and so forth in those early phases and progress from general stuff to specific. If we go straight, for example, if we use a contact sport like rugby um, as an example, if we go straight into match play and the athletes aren't used to any contact, they'll be susceptible to injury. So we need to gradually increase it over time and the exposure to different um, training volumes and training intensities is really important. As you can see here, if volume increases, specificity increases, intensity increases, and the volume will taper off as we go along in our training um, program. This is a this is the study that was published now recently, and they looked at, we all know what their long-term athletic development model is, and they want to do all the gap between the LTDA model and a training session and how to implement our training sessions for our youth athletes. The important part with this model was that they went and looked at the integration of the technical, the tactical and psychosocial elements of a training session. And by getting all these right in your training session, you're going to place your um, youth athletes at a lot better stead than what they would be if you're just focusing on the sport. So the the acronym they use is rampage and the ramp ra the the ramp part of that um rampage aspect is largely made about the how to do the structure your warm-up and the age would be how to structure your training session so the r for example is just raised we want to increase the body temper and so on and so forth activation is the aim is to activate the key working muscles mobilizing aiming to mobilize the key working muscles preparing the athlete for the intensity of that session for the p the A is the activity, the main technical and tactical focus of your session. G would be your games, implementing the technical, tactical, and, uh, or tactics within the game, and then evaluating at the end of the session during the cool down, giving some feedback to your players. And I'll give you an example of how they structure a session for rugby. Um, and this is what their session plan would look like. They'd have the squad, the duration of the session, what they want to work on, the different physical aspects, the psychosocial aspects, as well as session objectives. Then they would say, okay, the raise, we're going to do some a warm up for five minutes. We're going to do some activation or ability drills for five minutes. We're going to do the pretending part. So we can do acceleration, footwork, 10 meters, and so on and so forth for 10 minutes. Then we do activity for 15 minutes, games for 20 minutes, evaluation for five minutes. And it's quite a nice structure for you guys as coaches to use to ensure we get everything from not only from a strength and conditioning perspective and movement capacity perspective, but also from the sports specific perspective um, into a training session and then also give feedback to our younger players. Okay, 
I think I've spoken enough. I'll hand over to Rob to answer some questions. If you guys have questions, yeah, you can. Thanks, Wayne. That was awesome. Over to you, Robin. Must have stopped sharing. Uh, it's up to you. Um, I can't see to scroll back up again through the messages. So um, I okay. if I don't put this, um, post a Friday hockey match and then before playing a rugby match on a Saturday. Um, so I know that's quite a common theme across the weekend uh, um, sporting activities. Um, I think uh, in terms of recovery, it obviously comes down a lot to um, the type of facilities that you have available. Um, so, uh, Wayne, do Wayne, you mind turning your microphone off? Um, so, yeah, I think with recovery, it obviously comes down a lot to um, the type of facilities that you have available. Um, obviously, in our setting, we are fortunate to um, have things such as ice baths available. We do have um, recovery pumps available. We do have um, masseuse as part of our uh, team. So, obviously, those things help or contribute to enhancing recovery. But in a setting such as a school um, setting, I'd probably say that you need to focus on um, things such as your nutrition. Um, so, post your hockey game, you'd probably need to um, focus on that immediate refueling um, post the hockey game um, just to try and help replenish the muscle glycogen that has been used during that hockey match. Um, and then obviously things like your hydration, so just trying to um, get your system back up to homeostasis. Um, you want to obviously focus on your sleep that night. So on the Friday night, you're obviously wanting to try and get the recommended is more than eight hours, but a lot of the research now is, is also focusing on the quality of those eight hours. Um, so ensuring that, that the athlete is getting enough sleep um, on that Friday night. I know obviously um, adrenaline plays quite a role in terms of affecting sleep after a match. So um, it's just probably trying to educate the athletes around what they can do in the environment to try and help them sleep a little bit better. Um, but that's obviously a really, really important factor. Um, it would also be things such as they could possibly do things like hot and cold showers um, on the Friday night. So either at the venue or when they get back home, they can just jump into um, a cold shower for two to three minutes and then do that again with a hot shower and just alternate up to five sets. Um, then obviously you've got the, you've got things like compression pants um, or compression tights. So just wearing those through the night while they're sleeping um, could also just help them recover a little bit better. Um, and then, and then the next morning, so on the Saturday morning, um, it's obviously just getting up and refueling again. So just making sure that they're getting in a good, um, healthy breakfast. And then what we focus a lot on, on that, on that second morning is, um, just getting the guys to move a lot is just getting them to move early. So once we've had our breakfast, we'll often go through, um, either hydrotherapy sessions or getting them into the pool, um, just getting some, getting them doing some dynamic movements. Um, loosening up a little bit, we'll go through a very specific mobility um, sequence, um, and we just we just find that it helps them um, a lot better in that second match. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably what I'd recommend in terms of focusing on recovery post hockey match on the Friday, and then before your rugby match on the Saturday. Wayne, well, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. No, I think you covered all. Cool. Um, the second question that came through was from Brian. Um, it was also a really good question. Um, Brian, just excuse me if I, again, don't get the full um, question, but what it was basically asking was um, around the structure of their training sessions throughout a week um, and trying to train their technical skills under a little bit of fatigue. Um, so, yeah, so it's a good question and um, it is quite an important factor to consider when you set up your weekly microcycle or your weekly training structure. Um, and I think what you said in your question was that you 
on your first two sessions of the week, you prioritized your technical skills first, and then you had conditioning at the end. And then your later training sessions in the week, you transitioned to conditioning in the beginning of the session. And then your technical skills at the end, just to try and train them under a little bit of fatigue. I don't think I can't really see any faults in doing it that way. I think, um, for us, it's obviously really important to try and develop the technical skill to a level where they can actually execute it under fatigue. I think if you're trying to execute a skill under fatigue, when they haven't really developed that skill optimally, um, you'll find that the training session is, is not really effective. So I think you kind of need to play it uh, based on what your context is like, what the skill level of your players are at that time. Um, another way that we kind of um, do it in our setting is that we um, dedicate certain training sessions to certain physical, technical, tactical outcomes. Um, so we just structure it based on, we call it green sessions and red sessions. So a green session in a week would be um, purely technical, technical based where we won't really focus on any physical outcome of the session. Um, we are just purely focusing on, um, trying to execute a specific skill. It might be an individual skill or it might be uh, more of an interrelated skill between different lines. Um, so yeah, we're not really, the, the, there's no, there's not much of a physical aspect from that session, but it's more of a technical aspect. And then when we go into something called a red session, it's when we transition into more. Um, of a tactical situation, but there's also a very big physical component to the outcome of the session. Um, and that's where we will often um, include blocks of conditioning. Uh, we'll also play, there'll also be a big focus on um, small sided games in that section. So um, that's kind of how we structure it in our setting. Um, we kind of combine the session with conditioning, with technical, with tactical, um, just so that we're training holistically. Um, I, I hope that answers your question, Brian. If it hasn't, then just uh, feel free to pop again into the comment section. Wayne, is there anything you want to add? Um, I think Rob's covered most of it. I think the important part is to consider the age group. I think training under fatigue at a young age is probably detrimental to their actual skill development. Um, like Rob said, we, we do do quite a lot at the elite level. Uh, however, if I would say if you're doing it at under 14 level, how important is winning at under 14 level if you're training under fatigue? I think the most important thing is to get them resilient enough and get them fit enough to actually handle those stresses. Um, but if you're moving into first team sports and it's a win at all costs, then yeah, for sure, maybe looking at training under fatigue is a good aspect. But again, I would look at developing South African hockey players rather than winning a first team, first team hockey match. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I see there's, there's another question there from Ryan. Um, another question. Is actual level, actual level Rob, how much time? Um, just yeah. asking how much time do we allocate to mental Robin, I'm not sure if you can continue chatting, but we can't hear you at all. Sorry, go for it, Brendan. Uh, we just lost you there, Rob. Uh, Rob, sorry, yeah, we lost you there. Um, so I don't know if you could possibly address. Um. Mental conditioning is obviously um, hugely important. Um, uh, sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Hello? Can you hear me, Ben? I've got you. Can I? Uh... Just uh, stop me again if you can't hear me. Okay. I think we got the, the mental conditioning is a huge part of it, but um, that was it. I don't know if you had more to elaborate or. 
if Ryan is happy with the answer, if you got the answer. Yep. And uh, no, no, I've got a little bit more to add. I think, um, yeah, it's obviously a hugely important aspect of um, performing at an elite level, um, just due to the, the obvious pressures that um, elite athletes um, feel. So uh, we do try and combine it into um, our weekly uh, schedules as much as we can. Um, we, there, is, there is a psychologist that we work with, um, so that obviously does help the players quite a bit, um, just trying to work through uh, certain scenarios that they might face, um, how do they, uh, what strategies can they come up with or develop to try and help them um, handle those specific situations. Um, so that's obviously uh, one part of addressing the mental conditioning side of things. Uh, we don't really subscribe to the notion of uh, physically flogging the players to try and develop the mental conditioning. Um, yeah, that's just not part of our philosophy. I think um, through our model in terms of how we structure our weekly training sessions, um, the type of drills that we do, we sort of, we just try and um, sort of alternate the type of mental aptitude or um, uh, uh, psychological engagement in the actual session. So, um, for example, during our red sessions on a certain day, there might be the drill might um, enforce the players to have a, have a bigger psychological engagement in the session. Um, so we might put them under certain uh, stressful situations or pressure situations in the training session um, so that they're actually getting that feeling of, of being under pressure while they're playing. Um, but then there also might be sessions in the week such as, an, such as a green session, a technical session where um, the psychological engagement of the session is a lot lower. Um, there isn't a lot of pressure in terms of the drill that they need to perform. Um, so in terms of how we structure the week, we definitely take into consideration the mental or the psychological engagement of the players in the session, just because we feel that if every single session is, is of a very high psychological engagement, there is obviously that chance of um, becoming psychologically fatigued towards the end of the week and over, obviously over a period of time. So um, I think we, we kind of more address it in, term, in, in that way. Um, I know Wayne might have a little bit more to add in, in the sense of using a psychologist in, in our current situation. Um, I know in my coaches was um, a high performance coach and he focused um, a hell of a lot on the physical or the mental conditioning. And I think that was uh, one of the big reasons as to why we actually ended up winning the competition. So for me, um, a mental coach is probably one of the most important in terms of um, staff in an international um, setup. Yeah, I think I think Rob's covered it all. We we obviously using a psychologist every now and again in our setup. Um, working with the female team in India is a little bit different because uh, we really need to get buy-in from them a little bit. And I think it's probably similar in South Africa where um, female sport needs to be put on the forefront a little bit more. So getting getting these athletes to understand that they are important was quite quite a big thing for us. And getting them to express themselves a little bit more so getting a psychologist involved and getting them to help us understand the culture was really important um and, but i think we we use them to a point and then we also realized that uh too much of it is also fatiguing for the players uh so it was some point a lot of the senior players said look we don't need this anymore and we would prefer to do our own stuff um, a little bit more where some of the junior players still benefit from it but um, from a female athlete perspective it was quite important for us to get them involved to get them to understand how to express themselves and how to put themselves on the forefront especially in the um, Indian culture all right thanks James I think there's one final question um, if stress is felt regardless whether it's sport or academics what are your thoughts on academic exam sessions, which follows closely after a winter sports season? I think winter sports, rugby, hockey, netball, you alluded to it early on in the presentation. Go for Grubbs. Are you there, Robin? <laughs> Uh, I think he's frozen again. Okay. Alrighty, guys. I it, we have we have gone over the hour. I'm sure people are have got. I'm not 
sure, families, dinners, stuff. Yeah, um, if there are other questions, please feel free to to send them to the sports department. Um, if we can get back to to Wayne and and Robin sometime, and hopefully that will you know relay the questions. Or I think earlier on they had their contact details up. Uh, if they were happy for us to share them, but they are out there. Uh, Athlete Performance Authority there with their website. Um, but I, from our side at Athens, I really would like to say thank you very much to an awesome presentation. I think our coaches, I know our, Mike and myself, were thoroughly engaged the entire hour. Um, and a huge thank you to Wayne and Robert for giving up your, your time to chat with us this, this afternoon and present. And I would like to wish you all the best. I know, I think COVID has kept you in your jobs for another year in India. Um, with the, the Olympics being postponed to 2021. Yeah, we hope so. <laughs> and then, uh, well, wherever that may take yeah. you further, all the best for, for your careers, and we'll be following you very closely <laughs> and proud proud to have you as old Uplands past pupils. Maurice, right. thanks, Brendan, for having us. Really appreciate it. Hopefully, we can do it in person at some point in the yes, future. Yes, please. That would be great. <laughs> thanks, Wayne. Thanks, Robin. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks so guys. Much, Brendan. Really Cheers, mate. Thank you. Bye-bye.